So the beginning is the title of my discourse today is Recognizing God's Will Through His Spirit in Us. The picture, which you can see below the title, shows the problem. The guy in the picture has four different paths to take, to follow, and he doesn't know which of them is the will of God for him. And that's the problem many of us have. That's why I have decided to come up with a talk that will help myself understand the whole thing and also help others who may have similar problems understanding how to recognize God's will. We will limit, uh, I, I will limit myself in this talk only to recognizing God's will through his spirit in us. You will see that there are two more factors important, but uh, we will stick only to recognizing God's will through his spirit in us. And the first question is, which is more difficult? Is doing God's will more difficult or is recognizing God's will more difficult? I will give you 10 seconds to ponder this problem so that you can have uh, the answer for yourself. Is doing God's will more important for me or is recognizing God's will more difficult for me? As fallen sinners, we probably have problems with both, both doing God's will and recognizing it. But there are people who claim that it is much harder for them to recognize God's will than do it. They say they, if only they could recognize, were able to recognize that will, what God's will for them is, they would have no problem later on doing it. That's what they say. But I think that we have problems with both things. So um, it's good to understand all those different factors that make up, that make it up, that go into this process of recognizing God's will, because uh, whether we have more problems with doing or more problems doing than recognizing, first, recognizing. If, unless we recognize God's will, we will never do it. So recognizing God's will comes first anyway, uh, no matter which is more difficult for different for the individual people. So this talk is an attempt, my attempt at discovering the way God reveals his will to us so that our recognizing his will and then doing his will can be more conscious on our part, easier and as a result, more effective because we want to do God's will, and at least in theory, because in practice, sometimes the old Adam overcomes and we don't do God's will even if we realize what it is. But for the for the most part, in theory, to begin with, we want, we are committed, all of us are committed to doing God's will, and that's a priority for us. So uh, what we wish to understand is, first of all, how God leads us, his people. Hopefully, we are his people. So how God leads his people, including us, and number two, what it is that we can do, that we should do, that we have to do in order to make this leading, God's leading, more effective, or at least not to make it harder for God to lead us. As success or failure in this respect is up to us only, is wholly up to us, not up to God. Success or failure in this process is up to us only because God will always do his part perfectly and for our highest and eternal good, as he says through the apostle. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are, call, who are the called according to his purpose. So that's, that's why I, I want all of us, myself included, uh, to realize what it is, what comes into this process of recognizing God's will. And then if we understand that, we can cooperate better with God, who is doing everything for our eternal good. God leads us, his people, using three different agents. So three things are important. Number one, Bible teachings, and number two, his providence. The picture for, for providence is, yes, a nest with birds, I remember a, a picture from one of the talks in the past that somebody who wanted to present peace um, painted a picture uh, and a, a portrait. Well, as it was, I think a, a, it was a storm, heavy rain, heavy winds, strong, very strong winds, and a nest with uh, little birds uh, covered 
yes, by the wings of the father of, of, of the mother, the mother bird, and the little bird covered by the mother wings was very, very peaceful in that storm. So that was the real peace. That's why I chose this picture. But we are now going to talk about Bible teachings or God's providence as used by God in leading us. These two uh, subjects, or these two topics, are the subject of are the subject of another talk. In this one, I'm going to concentrate only on recognizing God's will through his spirit in us, because I think that's the most important thing. So I come up with this first. So um, the third way or agent used by God to lead us is the Holy Spirit in us. Not, please mind you, mind you, not just the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit in us. The Holy Spirit is God's thoughts, God's motives, and God's affections. Or in other words, it is what fills up God's mind, will, and heart. Or in other words, his character, his disposition. That's God's Holy Spirit. Uh, and the Holy Spirit in us is the same three things, but of course this time not in his mind, will, and heart, but in our mind, will, and heart. So the Holy Spirit in us is God's thoughts, motives, and affections in our mind, will, and heart. And that's one of, one of the three agents, and in, to me, the most important one, used by God in leading his people through the Holy Spirit in us. Developing the Holy Spirit in us is the one and all, the one and only purpose of the real baptism into the name of the Father, of the Son, and of, of the Holy Spirit. We remember that. Yes, from yes, these are Jesus' words. So, read the real baptism into the name of the Father. It means into God's character likeness. Into the name of the Son, into Christ's character likeness. Two great patterns, examples for us to follow. And also, our real baptism is into the name of the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus said. And by that, he must have meant into God's and Christ's character like this, as present in those who have already developed that spirit, developed that likeness, at least to some extent, and as such can be examples, patterns to follow by others. The Apostle says about it, setting himself as, in, as an example to others in First Corinthians, be you followers of me, even as I am also of Christ. Be you followers of me. So he sets himself as an example to follow uh, by those who are at the beginning of the journey, who haven't made this kind of progress that the apostle has. And as such, they can use him as an example. So it is this spirit its measure in us that makes it possible for us to recognize more or less correctly God's will as expressed in his word and his providences, which are the other two agents used by God, as that's how the three methods of God leading us are interrelated. God speaks to, speaks to us through his word and through his providences, and we, by means of his spirit in us, try to uncover try to decipher what he says. So he uses his word, his providences, speaking to us, but we have to receive it. And we receive it, we decipher, we read it by means of his spirit in us. That's why it is so, so important, that Holy Spirit in us. In order to better understand this mechanism, let me use an Old Testament picture of how God led ancient Israel through his high priest. When the latter, the high priest, had any queries to God, they obtained God's answers through the Urim and Tumim. I think that's a Hebrew-like pronunciation, so I am closer to the original, Urim and Tumim, about which there exist various, various philosophies. You can read, you can read them online or in different books. So we are not going to consider that because it would be a waste of time. So let us go directly to what the Bible says about it. Here are all the scriptures with that phrase. I'm not going to quote those scriptures at all because they do not contain anything more than just this phrase. No explanation what, what this Urim, Urim and Tumim was. Well, it is just mentioned. So these are all 
for the record, I put all those different scriptures on the screen, but we are not going to read them because the, the, that would, mm, wouldn't give us mm, anything. The fact that the, breastplate, that the breastplate of the effort was called such before the 12 precious stones with the names of the 12 tribes were put in it suggests that the Urim and Tumim must refer to the stones that were put into that breastplate later. And here's the quote. You shall make the breastplate of judgment, and you shall put settings of stones in it, four rows of stones, then the names follow, but the names of the stones are irrelevant as firstly they are variously rendered in the in the different translations of the bible and secondly it is not them but what they represent that counts i will come to that what they represent in a minute so all those different stones they shall be set in gold settings i continue the quote and the stones shall have the names of the sons of israel 12 according to their names and you shall put in the breastplate of judgment the urim and the tumim and they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. Over Aaron's heart has been underlined by me because I want to, to, to emphasize how, how important, how close, how dear it was to be for Aaron on his heart. Yeah. Now, when the priest asked God a question, light shone on the 12 stones, and depending on the direction, it was reflected in from those stones. It indicated God's answer as either yes or no. We don't know the direction, whether it was up or down, to the left or to the right, but that's not, again, that's not relevant. The high priest knew how to interpret that. Depending on the direction it was reflected in, it meant a definite answer from God to the priest. The meaning of the two words, urim, is light. And Tumim is perfections, both in the plural. And that suggests that Urim was the light shining on the stones, and that Tumim were the stones reflecting the light. And to get God's answers, answer answers, both are equally needed. You can't have one without the other. So you must the light, Urim, and you must the stones, the Tumim, which reflect that light. And only after that reflection, uh, up or down, to the left or to the right, you can have, you do have God's answer, and then you, you know what God told you. That's, that's how the types worked. What does it mean for us today? Let me quote from Brother Johnson, as you can see here, uh, E Volume 8. We do know it to be a fact that our high priest, in answering our qu queries by the antitypical Urim and Tumim, does give his answers by and according to the Bible's teachings and its divinely prescribed chief graces or virtues. This word is, is, is understood better by people who are not into the Parisia and Epiphany literature. Hence, the antitype of the Urim and Tumim is clear. The former are the Bible doctrines, Urim, and the latter, Tumim, are the chief are the chief graces. That's what Brother Johnson left us, and I think that's that, that's the best explanation, the best definition that one can give. You know, I, I will I will prove it as we go. So Urim or lights represent or stand for Bible teachings, Bible doctrines. To meme or there's the precious stones stand for the twelve chief chief character graces or character virtues. Graces or virtues, they have a sim very similar names. A grace is a characteristic or a feature of our character that is based on disinterested love, with virtue uh, being based on righteousness. So graces are probably more for the for those, for those classes who will be heavenly. They need um, characters developed to a higher degree. And virtues are the same characteristics or character features but based on righteousness or justice and that they will be enough sufficient for those who will be here on earth. The, uh, compare the 12 stones of the New Jerusalem, uh, that is the Christ soon to come down from heaven for all our sakes. In Revelation we read, the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. And again, the list follows, I'm not going to read it, 
for the same reason. We don't care about the names as it is not them, but what they represent that counts and they represent the beauties of one's character, the graces or virtues, depending on the plane of being, heavenly or earthly. And also compare the nine stones of Lucifer's character before the fall from Ezekiel. You were the seal of perfection, it says about Lucifer before his fall, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, and the list follows again. And we are not interested in the names because it's not them, but what they represent that counts. Here I can only we can only note that the, num the number of stones in Lucifer's character before his fall was nine, whereas in all the other cases it is twelve, twelve chief, chief graces. So it goes to show that even before his fall, Lucifer, even though perfect, he was not completely perfect. He was not absolutely perfect. His development in, in perfection was probably still underway, was in the process of being of being shaped. He was still being tested. And before he reached the 12 precious stones in his character, he fell, as we all know. Um, but but that's probably the, the, the number of his stones is only nine, because in all the other cases, the Bible mentions 12 stones and even 12 fruits to be developed in the restitution class. It's always 12. The 12 precious stones of the New Jerusalem must be the ones from the First Corinthians and from Second Peter. Yes, we, these are very familiar scriptures. Um, the apostle mentions faith, hope, self-control, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, which for us, under which we understand duty love, and love, agape love, this disinterested love that uh, that uh, that flow which is what which is due to which is love that flows from our love of good principles this agape agape love a disinterested love is ready to sacrifice is ready to give life if necessary for the sake of a good cause whereas due to love will never go that far so here the number is seven the number of those um, graces mentioned is seven, but we we need twelve. Probably is the, the, the other five are the fruits of the spirit from Galatians five, and there we have mentioned love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. Some of them repeated again. Which of them to add to get the complete number of twelve? Uh, I, I'm not sure. I don't know because no, nobody has come up has come up with a list of 12 um, characteristics or yes 12 graces or virtues that, that are that constitute those 12 precious stones but brother johnson singly mentions three others joy peace and goodness in all this in his literature here and there mentioned talking about this or that he mentions in passing so to say or as if in passing joy peace goodness so uh, that would bring the total number of uh, those precious stones to 10. Seven from the Bible, so we can be sure about them. The, the seven must be uh, part of those 12 precious stones. And five more, according to Brother Johnson, it was joy, peace and goodness. I haven't found any other mentioned by him. But it sounds very, very close to 12, so we, I think, could be very happy. And it doesn't matter what they are, because these are 12 most important graces or virtues and of course we can enumerate one we can enumerate four depending on how detailed you want to be you can come up with just one grace love or you can break it down into four into seven into 12 and probably beyond 12 i don't know any other number so probably beyond if we want to go beyond 12 we would have to enumerate all of them or all of those different so so 12 is probably this this maximum this this maximum number of representing the whole character by not mentioning all of those the, the graces but just a limited number of them compare ezekiel 47 and to revelation 22 because they speak the same in the middle of the street and on either side of the river was the tree of life yeah the, a very a well-known uh, scripture which bore 12 fruits each tree yielding its fruit every month and here we have fruits not precious stones and of interest we could mark 
that her character graces, those growing out of love, seem to be represented in the Bible by precious stones, harder material of higher quality, of higher, much higher value. With character virtues growing out of justice shown by fruits of the tree, lower yeah, quality, thus pointing to the difference in the plane of being, either heavenly or earthly. So if we if we if we if we went to heaven we would have our graces shown in uh, precious stones if we remain here on earth as i expect we will and i will too i will have my graces if i if i am <laughs> lucky enough to develop all of them uh, in good quantity i will have them represented uh, by 12 fruits of the tree it would be nice to have them uh, to have uh, fruits of the tree, because that would give me, give, give everyone who would possess them a ticket, a passport to eternal life here on earth. What are, our, what are the conclusions from all this? It's not the end yet, it's not the end. Conclusions, my conclusions come in the very middle of my talk. So Bible teachings manifest or are permeated with the characters of God and Jesus, which are also the pattern for us to follow and develop in ourselves. We know that. We often talk about it as the truth and the spirit of the truth. And the Bible teachings are permeated with, with the truth and the spirit of the truth contained in that truth. That much is obvious to everyone. For us to become like God and Jesus in character, we must develop it. I mean character in ourselves. And that requires doing it, this process of development, in harmony with the teachings of the Bible, as only in this way can we become like them, God and Jesus, in character, only in this way. Of course, we will become like them, like God and Jesus in character, on the human plane, but we don't need anything more to live forever in God's kingdom on earth. We don't need, we don't need to be similar in character to God's heavenly character if we are to remain on earth but jesus had to be similar and so the little flock even though they when they were not the same it was a higher nature yes a star like stars different different stars but one star different differs from another even though all of them are stars now the next question to ask is: uh, Let's look at uh, at uh, it through the through the eyes of the type. The question is: Where did the light shining on Aaron's breastplate breastplate come from? The only light in the most holy came from the Shekinah, and the Shekinah stands for God's presence, for God's being with Israel. The Shekinah stood for God. If there was no Shekinah, there was no God. If there was the Shekinah there, it meant God stayed with Israel, accompanied Israel, was with them. The four chief attributes of, uh, attributes of God's character are in turn shown in the light itself and in the ark. The Shekinah light stands for wisdom, light, wisdom, an obvious association. The covering of the mercy seat stands for justice. That's where the blood was sprinkled. That's why we think it represented justice. And the two cherubs or cherubim in Hebrew uh, on the mercy seat, looking down at it, stand for power and love, ready to act if and only if justice, which is the most important of God's attributes, gives its green light for action, whatever that action might be. So a beautiful picture represented in the tabernacle shadows by Pastor Russell, about those four yes four attributes of god's character shown in in that picture wonderful picture mm -hmm. so now please note what a beautiful picture we now get the light of bible teachings the urim falls on the chi on the 12 chief character stones the tumim which then give God's answer by reflecting the light in a given direction. Yes, we, as we said, we don't know whether it was to the left, to the right, up or down, but the, the, yes, the high priest under, understood what it meant. The light of Bible teachings, the Urim, falls on the 12 chief character stones, the Tumim, 
which then give God's answer by reflecting the light in a given direction. And let's continue now. What does the direction of the reflected of the reflected light or of God's answer depend on? On the condition of the twelve films, the polishment and the angles. The more polished and the better arrayed they are, the clearer and the more beautiful the light reflected by them, and the more definite is direction. To the left, to the right, or maybe a little to the left, if yes, if it is not very clear, yes, if the condition was worse and the array not as perfect as it should be, then the light would be very, very faint and its direction of reflection uncertain and scattered. So no matter whether it was to the light, to the left or to the right, whether it was reflected up or down, it was clear for the high priest what, what, what was meant. Whereas if, the, if those stones were not perfectly polished or if the angles were not correct, were not right, then the reflection could be a little to the, right, to the left and a little to the right. And then the priest wouldn't know what God answered, what God's answer to that question was. So you, I think that it's, it's clear to all of us that the, the, the direction of reflection of that light depended on the quality, on the quality of the stones. So the stones here are of paramount importance. Because if they are not good enough, if they are not polished well, if they are not arrayed properly with improper angles, then of course they will reflect uh, the light, but the direction of that reflection will not be clear to the perceiver, yes, to the person seeing that, to the observer. So, accordingly, two things are of paramount importance in the process of recognizing God's will. Urim, the pure light of the truth, is important, and the Tumim, the condition of our character stones, or the spirit of the truth. Dependent as it always is on our practical obedience to the light of the truth. Those two things are very, very important because we see them at work here in that picture. Both the Urim, the light, and the Tumim, the, the stones reflecting the light. And any legs in one or the other, so any legs in the Uri, Urim, or in the Tumim, distort our recognition of God's will, proportionately to how serious these legs are. That's obvious. If the light is dim, the reflection or the direction of the reflection will not be certain, or maybe there will be no reflection at all. And if the, or if the Tumim are not correct, if they are not polished at all, they will not reflect at all, or their reflection will be very faint, hardly visible to it. At the end of the day, it is the spirit of the truth, that is, the condition of our character stones, that clinches it, as shown by Jesus' words from John 4. He said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. In spirit and truth not in truth and spirit, but the other way around, in spirit in, and truth. And surely it is no accident that Jesus changed the chronological order between the truth and the spirit. Why do I say that uh, he changed this chronological order? He put spirit first, but everyone knows that the path to the spirit starts from the truth, from the truth obeyed and adhered to. Only after we get the truth which we obey can we develop its spirit in us. But to show which of the two is more important, Jesus in John 4, 24 said that we and that God is looking for those who worship him in spirit and, and truth. It is this spirit of the truth. It is the Holy Spirit in us. Or it is the degree to which our characters are like the characters of God and Jesus that makes us react so differently to the same truth or to the same facts of life, to the same events we come across in our life, in the course of our lives. Why did the people below react the way they did? For example, the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan seeing hot dead men lying on the side of the road. Why did the first to just walk by and uh, leave the hot dead men lying there, and the Samaritan did not? Wasn't it because of the 
character stones, the way they reacted, they reacted in the way suggested by their stones. The, their stones, their character stones, didn't keep them next to the men, didn't force them to give to us, to give to come to his rescue, to give him assistance uh, as the Samaritan, which the Samaritan did. Or the ten lepers healed by Jesus. Why was it that only one of them returned to give thanks, whereas the other nine did not feel the need to do so? Wasn't it because of the stones of character were of this kind and they didn't feel the, the stones of character didn't tell them to go back didn't tell them to show gratitude which was well probably a kind of duty for them to do because for, for, for what if we get something we should show thanks gratitude we should acknowledge it somehow not just leave it and leave it unanswered as if nothing had happened or when the New York Twin Towers went down in 2001, killing about 3,000 people in the process, for some people in the world, it was an occasion to joyfully celebrate by giving away candies to people in the street. I, uh, I won't tell you now who did that, but if you, if you don't know, you can check it out somewhere, because I don't want, I don't want to be seen as the person who is hostile to some na nationalities to some races, but there were people, not individual people, but whole masses of people in some countries who joyfully celebrated that occasion, giving away candies to people in the street to show how happy they were that about 3,000 people died in the process. The history of the Gospel Age proves that even very little truth, or the truth partially mixed with error, is capable of developing character in a child of God making them fit even for the plane of the divine nature. That's what facts show, is the course of the whole gospel age shows that. I cannot say today how much truth one needs and how pure it must be, but it must be so sufficient in amount and in purity as to make an obedient child of God develop his or her, or her character for the various classes of God's spiritual Israel of the gospel age. There's no other way, there's no way around it. It must be sufficient in amount and sufficient in purity so as to make an obedient child of God, the one who practices, puts into practice the, 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 the truth. And that yes, he or she can develop the uh, character for the various classes of spiritual Israel. The key thing seems to be obedience to the truth or to what one sincerely believes to be the truth, even if it is not entirely free from error. But you have to be obedient to what you believe to be the truth. That develops character. Only God knows where the borderline is, how pure it must be, uh, and, but the borderline is somewhere there. It must be as pure and pra practiced by an obedient child of God so as to re develop that kind of character in him or in her. What is certain, however, is that if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his or he is none of his, as the apostle says in Romans 8, 9. If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. So if you do not have enough light to develop that kind of character, you had it too little. Also compare other words by our Lord from Matthew and John. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will de declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, who pervert God's character and plan. Who, who had a lot of error, who taught, produced, taught and practiced a lot of error about me. So there will be some Christians who will, who will hear it. I wouldn't like to hear it, but there will be Christians who will hear it. That's what, what our Lord says. Or, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte. And when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell or Gehenna as yourselves. That was not only about the scribes and Pharisees, that's also about Christians who travel land and sea to win proselytes, to get people into their Christian, uh, into their 
church, into their denomination, into their sect. But they do it in the way the Pharisees did and make them twice as much a son of hell, Gehenna. And we know what Gehenna stands for in the Bible. Nothing pleasant. Or, another quote, they will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father or me. You see, some Christians killing other Christians, thinking that they are doing God's service by killing other Christians. And Jesus says that they will do things, they do those things because they haven't known the Father or Jesus himself. There will be such Christians who will hear it. That's for sure. It's always best to know the pure truth and to be fully obedient to it. That's another certain thing we can be sure of. While getting answers from God, our Lord had no problem recognizing the direction pointed at by Bible teachings and God's providence. Why did he have no problem doing it? Because his stones of the 12 chief graces were perfectly polished and perfectly arrayed. So they never distorted his perception of God's will as expressed in God's word and providences. And what about us? Are our stones equally reliable? Sadly not, which is why we oftentimes mistakenly understand God's will for us and for others. Although it is the same word and providences of the same God that speak to us, what they say is not always the same to us, to all of us. The truth of the Bible and God's providences are interpreted by us, that's the explanation why it is so, because the truth of the Bible and God's providences are interpreted by us in a way dependent on the quality of our character stones, on the quality of our Holy Spirit, of the Holy Spirit in us, of the spirit of the truth in us. The more we have of it, the more accurate and reliable our reading of them is, the more we have of that spirit, of the Holy, of the Holy Spirit in us, the more accurate and the more reliable our reading of Bible teachings and God's providences is. The less we have of it, the more missed and unreliable our reading is. Sometimes our reading is missed so much that one child of God speaks evil of another child of God, persecutes them, and even go as far as to brutally kill them, as all history proves. In a new situation, the faithful do God's will not because they know the whole truth on that situation, not because of that. And the other faithful don't know that truth. That's not the reason. The reason is different. The reason is because the truth acquired so far, that's one thing, but even more importantly, first and foremost, the spirit of the truth in the form of stones of character developed by them and in them. So the truth acquired so far, and first and foremost, the spirit of the truth in the form of stones of character developed by them and in them, intuitively make it possible for them to see, to feel, to sense the truth and righteousness, as opposed to error and unrighteousness in each and every new situation they find themselves in. That's the answer to that problematic question. How can we know God's will in, an, in a new situation? Yes, in the future. How will we know in the future? We will not get the truth before that situation. We will not get the whole truth on that situation, but we will get we will we will have some truth. And first of all, we will have we should have the spirit of the truth developed on that truth, got, gotten by uh, us from God so far. It is only after the trial is over that everyone gets the relevant knowledge, which explains the whole situation. But for the unfaithful, it is. Too late. Please compare the puzzlement of the foolish virgins on finding the door closed, or the puzzlement of the goats on learning why they do not deserve eternal life. Lord, why did we, when did we see you hungry, thirsty, a stranger, naked or sick or in prison, and did not minister to you? They didn't realize they were doing such things because they were not doing those things. They were doing something else, and that was interpreted by the Lord as done or not done to him, or please compare the puzzlement of the Egyptians on being flooded by and with the waters of the Red Sea. What did they say? 
let us fl flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. They thought up, up, until, up until then, they thought that the God was with them, with the Egyptians. And when the waters started to flood them and kill them, they realized that it's the other way around. The Lord fights for, this, uh, for them, for the Israelites, against the Egyptians. So what a total misunderstanding, a complete misunderstanding of the right way, of the right path to take. Because there are stones of character. Here, here, here it, it was only in the type here in the Red Sea, but the antitype will be on a much higher scale. The, 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 the stones of character will tell some people to do exactly that, what the Egyptians did. The same truth can be light to some and darkness to others, depending on the condition of the stones of character. Please note what we read in Exodus 14. Again, the Red Sea, the Egyptians, the Israelites fleeing from them. And the pillar of cloud went before, uh, went from before them and stood behind them. And uh, so it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all that night. One and the same pillar of smoke, standing for the truth as due, was a cloud and darkness to the one camp and gave light to the other camp. How come that the same truth is darkness to some people and light to other people? What does it depend on? It is the same truth. It's not, it's not, there are no, it's not another version of the truth or half truth or error. It's that it's the same truth perceived, seen, um, received in a different way, in such a different way, depending on the stones of character or of the individual people. If we want to better recognize God's will for us, in other words, what he says to us through his word and through his providences in our lives, let us try and develop as much of the Holy Spirit as we possibly can. To which Jesus encourages us by saying, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Then, recognizing God's will will be as easy for us as it was for Jesus. And my final words are, let us help God make it our reality in this life, as much as we possibly can in this life. Even if it is not complete in this life, let's continue. We will continue in the next. But let's help God make it our reality in this life and in the next life. So sooner or later, we will become his, Jesus's, Jesus's copies of character, in character on the human plane. May God add his blessings. Thank you.